Okay. Uh, good morning again, everybody. Um, so, so those of you who are not uh, here yesterday, just for a quick recap, um, I started with a discussion about a lot of programming models and their challenges in designing exoskeletal systems. And yesterday we went over in depth uh, about uh, MPI, PGAS, and then the MPI plus PGAS hybrid. Okay. And in those, the, the talk, I also went over the, some of the challenges the community is facing in designing these programming models and their designs for exoskeletal systems. So we talked about some of these points, like how do we scale to million to million processor? How do we do hybrid programming? Balancing inter-node and inter-node communication with endpoint designs, efficient multi-threading. How do we take advantage of the emerging GP GPUs and, and um, mic accelerators? And uh, collective communications, fault tolerance, QoS support, et cetera. And in that context, I introduced our project, MAPIS2, which we have been doing for almost last 12 years, MAPIS2, and now we have the MAPIS2X, which has the hybrid MPI and PGAS. So we went over a lot of these details yesterday, um, the scalability, collective, hybrid programming, and today we'll focus on these four uh, directions. The first one will start with the support for uh, accelerators like GPGPUs, then Intel Mic, then how do we take advantage of QoS support uh, for performance isolations uh, in the clusters, and then um, take a look at some of the emerging trends in the fault tolerance and resiliency. And I also indicated, like in our latest release, we have integrated the Lawrence Livermore's uh, scalable uh, checkpoint restart, SCR, and I'll also show some, um, some numbers and use cases. So let's start with the GPGPU. So yesterday we also heard the talks from NVIDIA, um, and there are a lot of challenges when you have this kind of GPUs. People have been like using it in offload mode, but if you really want to move data from a GPU buffer to GPU buffer, there are a lot of challenges. And that's what we'll start with, saying how you can achieve high performance MPI communications to and from GPU buffer. Okay, that'll be the first one. And then, as some of you know, like the, there is a new GPU direct RDMA, which is coming up, and we have just very fresh, um, implementation of MAPIS2 on the GPU Direct RDMA, and I'll show you some numbers. These are very fresh numbers. Nobody has looked at it at all, except some of the NVIDIA people. Um, then, at the same time, yesterday also I introduced these newer uh, PGAS models like OpenSMAM and UPC. So those programming models also have the same challenges. It is not just the MPI. If you're trying to use OpenSMAM or UPC, how do you again move data from GPU buffer to GPU buffer? So I'll focus on these. So let's start with the initial, the GPU. So if you see any current system configuration, this is how things look like. Um, the, so you have the CPU, uh, the main memory, we have the GPU, the GPU memory, and then the chipset, and the IB is connected here, okay? Now the question is like, few years back, the challenges were like, how do you really register? Because InfiniBand also requires like to, for the data movement to register the memory, and GPU buffers also the same thing happens. So the solution, was that time the very nice solution is that from GPU memory you copy to the memory, then from memory again you copy to the registered space of InfiniBand and then send the data. So even to send a very small amount or large amount of data, you will see that there used to be three copies, okay? And obviously that is not very efficient. So, so then the GPU Direct came into picture. So this was the collaboration between Mellanox and NVIDIA to converge on the one memory registration technique, okay? So that you can register the same space for both the GPU device as well as the infinite, so you can avoid one copy here, the red line which was earlier. So you, you just, from the GPU memory, you copy to the system memory, and then the network takes it. Now, now there was some misconception earlier, the people in the beginning thought that GPU Direct solves everything, but that's not true, okay? The GPU Direct still doesn't allow you to bypass the host memory. That's what the new GPU Direct RDMA does, okay? So I just want to clarify this. Uh, differences. So most of the current um, generation infinite with GPU systems actually work in this mode, okay? Now if you think of this mode, so now let's see how you want to do the communication or how people are trying to do the communication. So let's think of like this is an animation which we'll try to explain. So let's say we have the one of the GPU node with infinite connected with the switch and it goes to the other one. So the challenge is to move data from this GPU buffer here to the GPU buffer here. Okay, just like let's say you're trying to write MPI programs, you always like send, let's say from host memory to host memory, we want to send from GPU memory to GPU memory. 
So obviously, there are naive implementations which many people use. So at the sender, what you do is CUDA mem copy, just copy the data to the, uh, to, the CP, uh, to the host memory, and then do an MPI send. The data goes there. Then at the receiver, you do MPI receive to receive the data, and then you do another CUDA mem copy, and the data goes there. Okay, so that is a very naive implementation. So we call this like a high productivity but poor performance. In the sense like productivity wise, anybody can write these kind of programs, but the performance is very poor because we are trying to make one copy here, another data network transfer, and then another copy. Of course, there are some advanced users. What they do is like they try to do pipelining at the user level with non-blocking MPI and CUDA interfaces, okay? So the way it will look like if you have this data, what happens is the user, the end user is trying to chunk this data into some kind of segments, and then the pipelining is happening in these three steps, like from the GPU to the host memory, then over the network, and then copy here. So the code will look like this. We do at the sender, CUDA mem async. We try to do the pipelining, and then we do the MPI I send. And then you do the MPI wait all. Now, sometimes, so there are two issues here. What happens is, even though the user might be thinking that I'm trying to do these chunks, as some of you know, MPI internal designs could be a little bit different. Like it could have an eager path versus a rendezvous path. So whatever you might be doing, the chunking at the upper layer may not match with the, with the lower layer. So you may not get the best performance. And, uh, but the, this scheme we call like high performance and poor productivity in the sense it can give you performance, but think of the end user who is a scientist or an engineer is trying to understand what is happening in the, in the underlying layer, the GPU network, and trying to spend time here to, to enhance the protocol instead of actually focusing on his or her science. Okay? So this uh, challenge we, we saw almost two years back. Then we asked the question saying that, can we do something better? So can these kind of things be done within the MPI library so that the end user doesn't have to worry about all this kind of pipelining, et cetera? So in that way, our objective is that can we do MPI send and MPI receive from or to GPU memory directly, okay? And so the idea was to provide high performance without exposing the low-level details to the programmer so that this pipeline data transfer can be done within the library, and this is what we started in the MRPS2 to support this functionality. So the way it works is that similar kind of things uh, we need to do, but the challenge was that how does the, at an MPI library layer, we detect that the buffer is at the host memory versus the, the GPU memory. And of course, that was the time the CUDA 4.0 was coming. And if some of you are aware, CUDA 4.0 introduced this unified virtual addressing. So that means in the same address space, we have the host memory and then the GPU memory. So given any address, we can quickly find out where it is, okay? And if it is in the GPU memory, then what we can do is we can try to do the similar kind of things, but see, this is within in, inside the MAPIS2 library. Okay, so the end user can just do MPI send on the sender, MPI receive at the receiver with the, with the appropriate buffer addresses which are on the GPU buffers, okay? So we, we identified this as high performance and high productivity. So that means it will give you the performance and the end user doesn't have to worry about all the uh, internal details and uh, the user can just use the regular calls, MPI send and receive. So the first time we presented this uh, the ISC 11, um, almost one and a half years back. So these were the kind of numbers we are getting. So this is the, the blue line is the, the naive implementation that where you do the mem copy and send. Then the, the red line is, is the, where you do the pipelining, the async copy, and then send. And finally, this was our initial design. So here we saw that at the, if we do this kind of design within the MPI library, we get almost like 45% improvement for large messages. And similarly, like uh, even, even compared to the advanced users pipeline design, we are able to get 24% improvement, okay? So, and we presented that results and gradually we started extending that to one-sided communication, collectives, communication with data types, all these internals of MPI, we tried to extend the similar functionality. And these were the, um, these were the papers. And as these papers were coming out, then we had some discussion with NVIDIA, then NVIDIA provided us a grant to saying, okay, why don't you really take these designs which have been published just take it into the MRPS2 so that the end users can use it. And that's what we have been doing for the last few years. So starting from the, like the MRPS2 1.8 release, which was done around SC11 timeframe, so we have provided MPI communication from MP NVIDIA GPU device memory, and it can actually 
we do the RDMA based designs for all combinations, not only GPU buffer to GPU buffer, but we can do GPU buffer to remote host, re local host to remote GPU, all the paths have been um, optimized. And also we can handle multi GPU adapters for node. A lot of systems these days are providing not just single GPU, but multiple GPUs. So then the question is how do you handle the data transfer between these D GPUs in the same node? So there we have taken advantage of the CUDA IPC uh, available since 4.1. And then, since the communication, the point-to-point -point communication cost structures gets modified, of course, you need to reflect that on the collective level also. So there also we have optimized and tuned collectives, and in the very late, uh, last release, uh, we have done also the MPI data type support. So while these things were going on, in fact, many people didn't know how to also measure this kind of performance, okay? And as you know, like, in addition to the, our standard MVAP is to stack, we have a OSU micro benchmarks, and this is where we enable the end users to actually evaluate the performance of many such micro level performance evaluation. So, so there again, we try to introduce a set of benchmarks so that the end users can actually try to evaluate this kind of cost of the data movement between the host to device or device to device. And very recently, two weeks back, in the 3.9 release, we got some requests that earlier it was only CUDA enabled, and now we have enabled also with open SEC. So all the GPU benchmarks you can download and you can configure to run with um, uh, CUDA or OpenACC. A lot of people are trying to move into the OpenACC framework. So if you have not used that, please feel free to use. So, so you can download these benchmarks from this site, and it's also available in an integrated manner with the MAPIS2 stack. If you download it, it is, it is also there. So, so the question here is then, the, even though we enabled in the MAPIS2 library, now the question is, does it reflect not only just the micro benchmarks numbers, but can real applications take advantage of it, okay? So that is the end goal. So here we worked with uh, some of the application scientists because earlier they were either doing the, like the naive implementation or they were doing the pipelining. We wanted to move them out and use the simple primitives what we are proposing. So we worked one, uh, with one scientist, um, Dr. Carlos Rosel from TAC. Um, so this is an application lattice Boltzmann method, LBM. Um, so they have both like a 1D decomposition and 3D decomposition. So here are the results like this is a 1D and this is the 3D, and these are the end execution time, and here we have one process per GPU per node. Uh, there are 16 nodes, and with different kinds of domain size, you can see that at the end application, we can give you around 10 to 13 percent improvement, okay, by using this, this new primitive and the, in the design of Apis 2. And in the 3D, we get like the similar kind of things like uh, here, like number of GPUs we are increasing, so up to 64 GPUs, we can give you like a 15% improvement. So it says that if we can really take advantage of the newer primitives and the optimized design, your end scientist not only can write his or her applications very easily, but also extract performance. So we also did the same thing with another scientist uh, from the Dr. Yifeng Kui from SDSC. So this is an application AWP ODC. Uh, this is a seismic modeling code. Uh, some of you might be familiar, it was a Gordon Bell Prize finalist at SC um, uh, 2010. So here again, uh, we have a configuration, one GPU process per node, and then the two GPU process per node, and here we get around like, around 11% uh, uh, benefit again at the, at the application level. So, so these codes are out there, I mean, so the, the MFS2 library is there, and I know a lot of people use it, so if you have not used it, I'll strongly encourage you to, to use these advanced features and see for your application how much you um, get the benefits. Now the next thing what is happening is that uh, this GPU direct RDMA, so let's see what, what it means. So, so the GPU direct RDMA again is the, the next uh, version which is coming out, uh, collaboration between NVIDIA and Mellanox. So the, here the idea is that instead of like going to host memory, you can really bypass, okay? So that means from the GPU memory, we should be able to directly send the data through InfiniMan to either to the other GPUs on the same node or also we can send it to the, to the remote. So that again cuts, cuts down one more memory copy, and, and the network adapter also can directly read data from the GPU divides, and it allows for better asynchronous communication, avoids copies through the host. So just last week, we got a preliminary driver, and we started working on, on having the MFS2 initial design, okay? These are again, as I said, very preliminary. These are just seven, 10 days of work from our side. I mean, so we are exploring all different designs. So please don't consider this as the final numbers. You will see much more better numbers coming out. So what we did is here, um, so this is the, this again, the 
internode MPI latency, so that means we are trying to send from GPU buffer on one node to the other GPU buffer on the other node and going through infinite map, okay? And uh, so this is based on the map is to 1.9b, that's the latest release, and this is on Intel Sandy Bridge system with, um, with uh, the Mellanox Connect X3 FDR. And, and what we have done, basically some of you might be knowing, and I'll explain that a little bit later on when I introduce the mic, Sandy Bridge has some chipset limitation, okay? Many of you might be knowing that, so that actually prevents to get the full bandwidth, okay? But in this design, I'll show you that you can get full bandwidth because our previous design was trying to make copy at the host, internal to the MPI library, so we don't go through that chipset limitation path. So what we did here is that, so we call it like a hybrid design, so this is the GPU direct RDMA hybrid. So what we have done is only the short messages, that's what we have optimized, not the large messages. Large messages, we fall back to our previous design. Okay, so that's why exactly you will see for the short messages, so this was like around uh, on the sandy base around 22 microsecond, and now we have reduced to eight microsecond. Okay, that's the, that's the best number we have so far. Again, as I said, we are exploring the newer designs and we'll see how that comes. So this is like a almost factor of three we have reduced. And large messages, since we are falling back because if it's a hybrid design, it's the same as the older design, we don't see any benefit. Okay, so that's the latency. And then the, this is the unidirectional bandwidth, like the rate at which you can send data from one GPU buffer on one node to the GPU buffer on the other node. And here you see that the new GPU direct RDMA design for short messages is pushing the bandwidth significantly in this small range, uh, sorry, the medium range. And this is where a lot of MPI applications fall. Uh, uh, if you would have heard from the other talk, so we are able to bump up the bandwidth here. And now if you see the, for large messages, so, so this is coming very close to the, the FDR bandwidth. 6,000, so we, we bypass that, the, the chipset limitation because our previous design was already doing kind of the host copy, okay? Um, so, so we can use that in an interchangeable manner. And, uh, and the bidirectional bandwidth, the same similar kind of trend we see for short messages, we are able to bump the bandwidth. And, and here again, we, we can try to do it um, uh, very good. There are some tuning one can handle here. This is because we are copying from the GPU buffer to to, to the host memory. There is a limit on at what chunk size you copy, and that has some effect. Uh, so this is the default. You can adjust this also to get around similar kind of a little bit higher um, benefit. So those are the further tuning we are able to, uh, to do. Any quick questions here so far? Everybody is awake in the morning with coffee, all right? Okay, morning is always the hard time. Okay, so, so if there are no questions, so let's, let's me, let me move to the other one. So this is the MPI side, okay? And as I said earlier uh, in the yesterday's talk, the other kind of programming model, the open spam, uh, UPCs are coming, and the challenges are very similar. So let's say, take off open spam. So this again, if you see this example, the currently what people do is like they do a host buffer, uh, then they do a CUDA mem copy, then they do a spam, open spam put memory, then do a barrier, and then the, on the processor one side, they again do a host buffer, barrier, and then could I mean copy, okay? So if you do like this, then again, you go through a lot of synchronization and, uh, and you don't get the real benefit. So what we did is recently, this is a paper which has been accepted, will be presented at IPDPS in the 2010, uh, sorry, 2013 in the May. Uh, so I'm just showing some preliminary numbers here. So we have introduced some new concepts of symmetric heap memory model. So through that, you can actually try to do very simple stuff, like at the PE0, you can just have some map pointer and do a one-sided like shared memory put memory. And in fact, in the PE1 side, there are no operations required. So this is direct one-sided, okay? And I talked a lot about this direct one-sided compared to the two-sided operations in yesterday's talk. And this actually allows the complete overlap of communication with the, with the computation. So if you see these, these are the kind of numbers. You see, so this is the SMEM get mem latency, so, so here we are trying to show four numbers here. This is the intranode that is current, and then the intranode proposed, and also internode, and then the current and internode proposed. So if you see here, this is the, like the yellow line is the internode, and then the green line, so we save here. And intranode, we get substantial benefit, because within the node, we are able to do much more faster. Um, and this is for the short messages, and this is for large messages. So then we took it into a little bit up, so this is a stencil 2D kernel. 
and we actually ran it on the Kinland systems so up to 192 GPUs. So here you will see that this Tencel 2D almost gives like a 65% benefits if you use this new approach versus the, the previous approach. And we also um, uh, experimented with the BFS kernel, which is a part of the, the Graph 500 list. Um, so similar kind of things here we see, as we keep on increasing the, uh, the, the number of GPUs, we get around like 12% benefit, okay? So what it shows that the techniques what we have proposed for MPI can also be extended, okay? But this is not with GPU direct RDMA. So these are the, only the previous ones. So if you change to GPU direct RDMA, you will again see much more uh, benefit here. And then we started looking at the, the UPC runtime also, the same thing, how you can do GPU to GPU communication. And again, the, if you see the existing UPC CUDA programs, uh, they have like complicated CUDA functions and temporary host buffers. They require explicit synchronization. They also require some involvement of remote UPC thread. So, so the thing what we proposed is that using this uh, unified virtual addressing scheme, can we actually extend some of the APIs in the UPC uh, trying to introduce like UPC on device versus UPC off device, and then take that through the unified addressing so that the UPC runtime knows where the, where the buffer is, and based on that, you can try to optimize the data movement. And then we try to do over the InfiniBand in our MFP2 stack, we have something called RDMA fast path for short messages or small medium messages, so we try to follow that design to, to in fact uh, have good UPC level communication. And we also have introduced some helper threads uh, for improved asynchronous access. So this paper was presented uh, last October at the PGAS uh, conference, so I'm just showing some numbers here. So similar kind of benefits you see here, this is like a UPC memput, um, the, this is the naive scheme, uh, versus this is the improved scheme for the smaller messages, we get around 34% benefit here, and then for the, the medium messages, uh, we get around 47% benefit, okay? Now here again, we try to look for applications uh, which can actually take advantage of these again. Since we are proposing new schemes, you don't immediately get those applications unless you have the previous one MPI, we were able to work with some application scientists, but here we are not even uh, able to do that. But we came up with some kind of a, like a synthetic matrix multiplication applications uh, just to show like in the communication time of the matrix multiplication, not the overall time, just trying to see in the communication time how much benefit we are seeing as you change from uh, like the, the N, which is the matrix size, N by N, if you keep on increasing, so here we get around 26 to 38% improvement. So, so here again, it demonstrates that for all these programming models, we need to really think in a new manner how we can take advantage of the, of the GPUs. Okay. So with this, now let me move to the, any, any additional questions here? So then next I'll move to the mic. So this is a new kind of accelerator we have been hearing a lot uh, recently. Um, so here I'll go into a little bit details like uh, saying what are the type of programming models being proposed for mic. Uh, we have done some initial design again, MWAP is to design for MPI level communication. I'll show some early performance for point to point collectives, kernels and applications and try to show continuing work, okay? Again, I just want to say these are all preliminary designs, okay, these are not the final designs, so continuously because the, anytime there is a new technology, you have to go through all these different internals just to try to understand what are the mechanisms are available, and here especially with the mic also, Intel is also continuously working on new drivers, and every, every week, I think Carl can talk, um, every week, two weeks, you get new kinds of drivers, new features, so it's a very running environment, um, so, so we are trying to work with that. So the, so the broadly the mic uh, architecture um, uh, Carl introduced a uh, little bit yesterday. Um, so, so the idea here is that this is the, like the Intel's approach is that if you have like the host and the mic, so both like this is the Intel Geon and this is the mic, both can run actually Linux. So that is the kind of the, uh, the difference here. So they try to provide the x86 compatibility so that the applications and libraries can run out of the box with minor modifications. But the difference is there, which will show once we go into the performance numbers, like the host is much more faster and mic processors are slower, okay? And also mic, even though in the, in the latest one of the mic card, you get around 60 cores, but each core runs smaller and also it has small memory. So all these things comes into play when we are trying to design the, like the MPI library, uh, trying to utilize this. So these are the, some of the charts I'm showing from Scott McMillan from Intel. 
trying to see what are the kind of programming models Intel has in mind. So I'm just presenting the slides for um, continuity. So, so the idea here is that if you think like this is the multi-core, and then these are the many core mic, so there could be different kinds of programming models. So the currently, mostly we do this is like all the code runs on the multi-core. So this is the offload mode, I think uh, in yesterday's Carl's talk, some people also asked the question. So that is the common mode which most of the people are using currently, okay? So the idea here is that you have the main program running here, so you take some of the functions and then just offload to the, uh, to the mic and get the results and then continue, okay? But the two other modes which are being proposed is the symmetric mode, or let's start from here, uh, symmetric mode. So that means you can actually run MPI jobs here, MPI jobs also here. So they are running both on the host and the mic, and they can work together. These are very challenging things, we'll, we'll see uh, why. And then the finally it is the many core hosted, so that means the cores actually run your MPI job, the host becomes secondary. Okay, so the reverse role reverse uh, reversal takes place from here to here. So the so the mic cores are running all the things, and the hosts are only doing helping the, the communication aspect. Okay, so what we'll try to focus here because offload board already is working with any MPI library, it can work. We try to explore this side. Okay, so now with this kind of high level picture, now let's see what happens in the communication. Again, these are the, some of the slides from from Intel, and then I'll explain. Uh, the internals, what happens in the MPI. So, so this picture, what it's trying to show, like let's say these are the hosts and these are their mic, okay? So this is the offload model. So what happens here is that, as, as we saw from the earlier, so from a uh, core here, the host, you offload the, the computation and get the data. But the communication is happening only between the host and over the network. So that's how they're connected, let's say InfiniBand. So these are the communications which are happening between the MPI. So the mics are not involved in any communication, so they are all isolated, local to the, uh, to the, um, to each of the nodes. So, so then there are like Intel mic, there have been a lot of different options, like you can use MPI OpenMP, there are Intel Silk Plus, Intel TBB, uh, pthreads. So here what we need to focus on the MPI communication, what you need is the intranode and internode, okay? So that any MPI library so far is good enough here, okay? So if you see our MVAP is two, that's what we have, uh, we have the InfiniBand layer, which is a CS3IB, and then the shared memory, I talked a lot about that yesterday. Uh, that's the internode communication. So we already have that in the existing library. And this is the, actually, this is the version running on the Stampede. So if you're running any experiments on Stampede with, with offload, this is the kind of environment you are trying to, trying to use, okay? So that is available, and people have been running, and that, that runs fine. Now let's see the many core hosted. So here the idea is that if, if the MPI jobs run here on the mic, so, so effectively, this mic should have capability to communicate, like from one mic to the other mic, okay? How we do it, we'll, we'll see. But that's the capability we need to provide. So the MPI process run on the Intel mic and the MPI communication. So what we'll see is there are two kinds of communication will happen. One is intra-mic because within the mic card, again, there are multiple cores. So they may talk to each other, okay? And, and then across the mic, which is inter-mic, so in this case, we need to do the host bypass and then then communicate. And it's also to be noted that this is also an open question, even though let's say mic has um, like 60 cores, now, as I said, the memory is limited. So in, from a practical viewpoint, you may not see somebody using all 60 MPI processes there, okay? Because the memory footprint will be bigger or you will get very little for your application, okay? So might be the, the idea again, this nobody knows the answer, like people are exploring, might be you'll run four, MPI task or eight or 16 or something like that, okay? And it may vary again from, from, from your environment or from your MPI application, how much parallelism you have, how much parallelism you can exploit through processes versus how much parallelism you can exploit through threads. So these are all open questions. Nobody knows the, the answer yet. So now if you see the, the complete symmetric model, see, see the complexity here, okay? So what it means that here we are trying to run jobs with uh, MPI processes on the host, MPI processes on the mic, and anybody can talk to each other, okay? Because just like an MPI, think of like we have 16 um, um, core sandy breeze, so we can run, let's say, 16 MPI process here, and on the mic, let's say another 16 we are running, so 32 MPI processes on a single node. So like this, on every node you can run, and anybody can talk to each other. So we need to design an MPI library which will support all this communication. So that's what is being shown through these yellow lines. 
So, so here, if you list down all these communications, so what we'll see that, of course, between the host, we need the intranode and internode. Similarly, between the mic, we need intramic and intramic. But in addition, we'll see these lines, like this is host to mic, mic to host. Okay? So all these like six possible paths we need to provide, and in the best possible manner, that is at the point-to-point -point layer. Then now the complexity comes, like how do you handle the collectives layer? I'll show you some number. This is a really big challenge because the processor speeds are also different now. So all the previous algorithms, whatever people have designed, they are under designed under homogeneous processors in mind, and now you need to totally rethink all those algorithms because some of them are faster, some of them are smaller. How many processes are participating? What will be your tree structure or ring? All, all kinds of issues come up. Okay. So, so to, to proceed along this line, so what we started with like for intramic, just to, we started first focusing on the intramic, saying if there are MPI processes, can they talk to each other and how do we do that? So what we introduced here is that the, the CS3 shared memory channel we had already for the intranode, and we, we tried to take advantage of that. We also introduced another thing uh, Intel provides here called SCIF. So this is the symmetric communication interface. So we tried to design a CS3 SCIF uh, for MWAPIS 2. It's a low-level communication interface over PCI bus, can be used for intramic communication, and allows more explicit use of DMA engines. And this allows, actually, if we have this complete design, it allows MPI process to run on the mic. Okay, you can run any number of processes. We, we allow it to run, to run up to 60, but you, it may not be beneficial. You can effectively use only four or eight or 16 um, for your applications. So now for the total mic to host communication, we need to also introduce some new things. So, so this is a very complicated, as you, as you see from the previous picture, the similar complexity is coming in the MPI stack. So let's say is the, is the host and the mic or the GN5 is there. So we have to establish the IB communication is already there. The IB skiff I introduced earlier. And now we also need to have a CS3 skiff here to, to talk from the host to, to the mic. Okay? So, so here we provide all these different interfaces, the CS3 skiff using skiff, OFA IB CS3, which is native IB, and then the words implemented over skiff. And with this kind of design, it actually allows MPI process to run on, on host and MPI in any, any numbers. Okay. So we have some of these prototypes designs there, and I'll show some num numbers again just to see how these um, uh, designs are coming out. So I'll show again point-to-point -point collectives, and I'll try to show some kernels and, and applications. But once again, I just want to say these are all very preliminary numbers, so don't make any direct comparisons or make any conclusions out of it. Um, so this is the first set of numbers. We can say it's the MVAP is to mic. So these are all numbers taken on the Stampede. So we are working very closely with the Stampede team and Carl uh, to get this going. Uh, so this is the intranode MPI. So, okay, so that means intranode on the host, intranode on the mic. Okay? And also, we have these two additional paths, host talking to mic, like an MPI process on the host talking to MPI process on the mic, and the reverse man. So what we see here is that intra-host, so that is basically the shared memory design, which yesterday I showed, like, we get almost like 190 nanoseconds. We can do uh, in, in the Sandy Bridge system. That's why you see this, this is very fast. Okay? But the intra-mic, like two MPI processes on the, at the mic, they're around in the three microsecond range. Okay? These are the small messages. These are, the, again, the large messages. And then the host to mic, mic to host, it starts with like this is the zero byte, but if you say the four bytes, it's around 5.5 microseconds. So two processes on the mic, when they are talking to each other, it takes around 5.5. Five microsecond. And for large messages, um, you see kind of similar trend, like the intranode host is the, is the most fast. The mic is the almost the slower because they are slower processors. So that, that's also being reflected here. And also, as you know, like the Intel mic card has only a ring interconnection, like double ring. It is not like a very fat tree or mess or any of those. So that also comes into picture. Well, later on, we'll see. Um, and then the host mic, mic host, fall somewhere in between. So this is, again, a design based on the MAPIS to 1.9A2, not the 1.9B. Yes. Right. No, no, here? No, this is, again, within happening within mic itself. So they're not even coming to the PCI. Is, is that the number, the green line you are showing, or this line? No, the bottom line is happening, again, within the node, so they, it's like a shared memory. 
communication. So that is not going into the, to the, no, no, let, let me explain again. This is intra-host. So that means within the host, we have Sandy Bridge, like 16 cores. So they're just talking to each other, that's all. Okay, so that is purely on shared memory. That's why this black number is always the best. Intra-mic, the green number is again, you say within the mic, processes are just talking to each other. They're not touching the PCI or anything. Okay, because they are slower processor and then the, the, it is a ring kind of communication. So this is what we see for very large messages, they're not good. And these are the things which are the host mic, mic host, okay? And this is where we have like a combination, like if we use uh, different techniques where to go through the IB or go through the skip, so they have the intermediate kind of results. It doesn't happen, it doesn't happen, okay. yes. We tried something, so, so we tried with a, the, just like the CPU binding, you can actually bind course to course. We have seen very variable performance. We tried all different kinds, we talked to Intel, but it is still not clear, so uh, how, whether the bindings will help or not. No, we don't, some, some situations we see very big like jump kind of things, others remain more or less the same, okay? But we, don't, we cannot explain why those jumps are coming. These are the best results, yes. Any other questions? Okay. So that is the intra node. So then the see the bandwidth follows very similar kind of trend. So again, this is the unidirectional bandwidth. So if you see the intra host, that goes very, because that's the pure sandy breeze within the memory, those are very fast. We can get very good numbers. Within the mic, again, that are, because the latency is higher, so that goes, um, uh, it doesn't perform that good, but, but here, internally, the mic host um, or host mic uh, falls somewhere in between. But uh, for the large messages, we use that skiff design I mentioned earlier, so that actually gives a performance boost, okay? So that's why you see the mic host to host to mic communication becomes for large messages, also we get, get good, good performance. So then this is the internode, okay? So those are the intranodes, so now we are talking about internodes, so here what we are doing is host to host, just the host talking with InfiniBand to another host, that's the black line. And then this is the mic to mic. So since mic has that x86 compatibility, so the Intel driver actually provides support. It's similar to GPU direct RDMA, you can think. Um, so that means the, the data can go from one mic it, over InfiniBand directly to the, to the other mic. And that is the, that is the green line. And then these are the host mic and the mic host, that's where somewhere in between. So here we see, as we have seen earlier, like uh, this is the, like the pure host to host number, this is coming around like uh, uh, 1.8 kind of microseconds. And here in the mic to mic, we see if you take the four bytes, it comes around like a 8.5 microsecond kind of things. And uh, the large message latency, similar kind of trends we see, uh, the host to host over InfiniBand, that is of course the best. Uh, mic to mic going over InfiniBand doesn't perform that well. And then the host mic, mic to host are, are in between. And then if we take a look at the internode MPI bandwidth, so this is where we see a big difference, and this is where that chipset limitation comes in, and I'll talk a little bit more into that later on. So here if you see the host-to-host -host bandwidth, this is like FDR, so we are able to get the FDR bandwidth, and uh, host-to-mic also, through the skiff, we are able to get good performance, but if you do the, the other two, like mic-to-mic, -mic, like going from one mic to over the network to the other mic, bandwidth is very bad now, okay? So you see the, at, at this level, and, and also the same thing happens also the, the mic to mic, both unidirectional and bidirectional, and I'll go into the details of this. This is the Sandy Bridge chipset limitation is, is playing the role here, and it requires a different kinds of design to alleviate, and that's what we are trying to work on now. Now then what we did is like, uh, yes, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, these are all over, like, that's what I said. Like, when we say mic to mic, these are actually one mic over InfiniBand to the other mic. Designed in similar fashion, meaning two cases, one having two mics, the same part, and doing mic to mic, mm -hmm. and then I get two mics over two parts. Yeah, yeah. And that is variational. Yes, yes. So these are only, um, I don't have, like, two mics connected 
on, on the same node, so there's one mic from one node to the other mic to the other or through InfiniMac. Yes? Why uh, uh, host to mic is so different than mic to host? Yeah, I'll, I'll come to those things. I'll just, just uh, hold on. Just a few, few slides, I'll, I'll come there. So then we took a look at the collective layer, okay, saying, okay, how, how we can, um, because the point point is working, so how the collectives can work. So here what we try to do, because we are trying to go into the symmetric model, what we try to do is just, again, some sample collectives we took, let's say 16 process collectives, okay. So we try to compare different configurations, what a user might be using, like either you use the 16 MPI process purely on host, or 16 MPI process on purely on mic, or you can have a mixed, Eight, eight running on host, eight running on mic, four running on the host, 12 running on the mic, or 12 running on the host, four on the mic. Just comparing the same number of MPI processes as an end user I want to run, and where should I run in what configuration and how does the collective perform, okay? It's just for a fair comparison. And now if you see here, so this is the all gather, um, and what we are showing here is that left hand sides are absolute numbers, and these are the normalized numbers, normalized with respect to the host. Okay, because the host numbers have been, people have been using that for a long time, so we try to normalize, so all these numbers are one, if you see. And here we see some interesting trends. So, so for example, the host, of course, does the well. The pure MPI, all the MPIs running on the mic uh, have the uh, not good performance because, again, the cores are smaller, uh, sorry, slower, and, and this is where the ring and all this communication happens. Earlier it was just point to point, but now when you are running a collective, there are multiple communications happening depending on how the, uh, the collective has been designed. So what, here what we see is, so this is like the host, this is the mic, and any combination of host mic falls in between. And of course, here you will see like eight host, eight, that is the green line here, uh, the four host, 12 mic is here, and then the 12 host, four mic is here. And, uh, and this is for like small messages, this is for large messages, here we see a clear trend. This is the host and this is the mic and these are on in between. And normalized, if you see here, this is what happens. Like any time we are involving the host, uh, sorry, the mic, the performance degrades, okay? No, this is an all gather. It's an MPI all gather. So it's a collective. So, so just like the issue of micro benchmarks, we take the collectives, we run it multiple times and then report the numbers, okay? But again, you need to see that it's a, how the collective is designed also matters here. Okay, so this is what I lead to. It's like a chicken and egg. How you handle the lower layer, then you also need to handle the upper layer to get the best performance. And this is the MPI B cast. Uh, similar kind of things we here we see. Uh, the heterogeneous mode uh, performs ores with increasing number of mic processes. So this is the pure host. Uh, if you think of the normalized, this is where all the, uh, the th this was a little bit variation, like four, Host 12 mic is doing worse than, let's say, the, all, the, um, all the 12 ho uh, or the 16 mic. And the, the reason this is what I was indicating, because this is the same broadcast algorithm. Whatever is in the MAP is to stack, we had optimized for host is running here. We have not done any modification, but that's what needs to be done, okay, for this mixed mode programming, because now you are involving a fast processor on the host with a slower processor on the mic. So, so you need to rethink how, how to reorganize the, the algorithms because if it is like a tree structure and the first message is going to the mic, it will always slow down everybody else, okay? So, so that's what again we need to do. We need to redesign with heterogeneity in mind and that is a big challenge for the community. Uh, for all the collectives, you need to reevaluate. So then we took like a P3D FFT application, same thing we did on the same configurations, 16 host versus all these other combinations. So you can see there is a big jump compared to the host any time you, you involves a mic, the performance degrades, okay? Because again, here the similar kind of things comes from the application point of view, you need to do a good load balancing, okay? That we have not done here. It is a P3D or 50, just like we're running on 16 processes, uh, but if, because the host processors are faster, mic processors are slower, as an end user application, you need to rethink how to, how to load balance so that you give more to the host, less to the mic, so that you can balance it out, okay? That again, the community has to, to work on. And uh, then we took a 3D stencil communication kernel. Um, the similar kind of trends um, you see here, uh, like this is the pure host and this is the, uh, the, the pure mic and somewhere in between. Of course, there are some jumps here and that needs to be again, all these libraries, as you know, there is a lot of tuning one has to do, uh, both at the point point collective. So again, none of those have been done. So, so we'll be working on those things 
And then you can see like some of these big peaks and all will go down. So then of course people have been using threads, so we try to now bring, saying okay, how, do, how will it look if we combine MPI and some threads, okay? So we took an application, so it's a home, uh, this is a application. So what we did here again is a, um, we tried to come up with different configurations, so it's a 64 host, that is pure MPI. So that means on the Sandy Bridge we have 16, so they're running on four nodes, okay? Pure with IB, so that's this line. So there are uh, zero threads here, zero running on MPI, um, per thread. Then we took some configuration here, like we are running on two host, six mic, and eight threads per each. Okay, so basically you can see eight processes and eight threads. So that is we are trying to compare with the 64. Okay. And this configuration is one MPI process on host, three on the mic, and 16 threads per MPI process. And here it is four MPI process running on the host, 12 on the mic, and four threads per process. And here again we see similar kind of thing. Of course the the, the host, pure host is doing the best, uh, but the mic, here we see a balance, like eight threads per process perform better than four and 16, and this also matches with one of the slides Carl showed yesterday, like for all these applications, you need to see how many number of threads is best for, for, for your job, okay? So, so again, I, I just want to show that these are all preliminary studies, and then one has to work in much more in depth to understand all this newer architecture and how to balance that and how to bring out a good MPI library so that we can actually allow the end users to, to really take advantage of both the, both the host and the mic, especially in the symmetric uh, programming perspective. So now if we, so this is the where the chipset limitation is coming. So here if we see what we, what we try to do, like different kinds of paths, so there are four paths here, like one is the red line, which is the mic to remote, so we are reading from here and sending over the network. The green line is remote host mic to, to, to that is the intra-IOH. So these are intra-IOH and this is intra-IOH. So this is the green line. And this is the blue line which is going over intra-IOH and this is the, the dark line is coming. So, so what is happening is this performance of IB reads from mic is limited. That is the chipset limitation. So that is the, if you see here these numbers like this is 370 megabytes, this is 960, whereas the number should be like this, 5280, five, okay? And, and this is what is the, is the bottleneck. And in order to do that, we are working on some kind of a host-based design. We call it like a proxy-based design. It, it is similar to like what we have done for the already for the GPUs, NVIDIA GPUs. So instead of the mic directly talking to the mic, the data has to come to the host, and the host actually performs the communication, okay? So if we can do that, the proxy process on the host to rely the communication, then we should be able to, to handle very good data bandwidth from, from mic to mic, and that is under work, and once we complete that, we should be able to report how those numbers come out, okay? Does that answer? I think some of the bandwidth questions, bottleneck issue are there, and this is what is happening at the chipset level. Any other questions here? Yes, yes. Yes. Yeah. Same thing. Yeah. So that is the bottleneck you need to. So that's why the, not only the unidirectional bandwidth, one of the number, host to mic was very good, but the mic to host was not good. But in the bidirectional bandwidth, they're symmetric, so it pulls down. Okay. So, so we need to rethink that we need to bring the data into the proxy or, or a proxy on the, on the host and then, then take care of it. This is a little bit different than the GPU because the GPU actually MPI process runs on the host even though you are using the GPU. Here we are saying the MPI process running on the, on the, on the mic, that's why you are saying there's the dummy or a proxy process you need to introduce at the host to take care of the communication. But that also will introduce scalability issues because you, you are running so many proxies, different jobs. So, so it's, it's, a, it's a quite uh, complex situation there to, to handle all these things. We'll see how best to, uh, to do so that people can actually utilize and on a large uh, system, um, uh, the symmetric uh, processing, okay? So let me then uh, continue with the, th the two remaining topics. So this was the major uh, presentation. Um, so the QoS support, so this I introduced yesterday, um, trying to say like, especially on some large clusters when different jobs are running, there is no way these days to, to really perform performance isolation. So if one job is trying to do a lot of I.O., 
you will see the other job is getting affected. So here we have been exploring especially the quality of service aspect of InfiniBand. As many of you know, like IB is capable of providing these user service levels, virtual lanes, and many clusters have not triggered these things. They just run on the default mode with only like uh, one virtual lane. So here we carried out some experiments like uh, the between one virtual lane, we, if we do a eight virtual lane, here we saw the point-to-point -point bandwidth, you can increase a little bit. But here what we do, did is um, inter-job, like there are like running one all-to-all -all versus the two all-to-all -all with no QoS, you see the performance degradation because they are interfering, okay? But then if we can provide QoS kind of things, trying to say that, okay, one all-to-all -all runs using one kind of SLVL combinations, the other one runs with another SLVL, then we should be able to isolate this performance. And here we saw like, uh, the, there's a CPMD applications which is which uses all to all. We should be able to actually gain some 10 to 20% uh, improvement here. Now that is with just the collectives, but here we actually went ahead and tried to look at this I/O noise. Okay. So so what is trying to show here, like asynchronous I/O introduced contention for network resources. So the question is, how do you should the data be orchestrated in a data staging architecture, and can the QS capabilities help? So what we try to do some experiments here trying to say like, let's say the, you are trying to send some big amount of data, okay? And while the data transfer is taking place, we introduce some background traffic with noise. That means some other traffic started using similar links, okay, or a part of the links. So this is what you see, the default, that's the red line. But then, in a, if you introduce the background noise, especially for large messages, you will see this dotted line, so your performance is degrading here. That is latency and this is bandwidth. But now if you do, the with, uh, with the noise isolated, that means if these two streams, we give them different kinds of SLVL combinations, then here you will see that uh, this, uh, the, the green line comes very close to the red line. So that means we are able to really give uh, uh, performance isolation across this, these traffics. Okay. And, and uh, that we try to do here with some, these are the NAS model benchmarks. This is with the AWP um, application. Um, so again, we have showing the numbers normalized runtime. So that means this is our default, like in an, uh, if no other jobs are running, this is how much time it will take. But with IO noise, suddenly it gets degraded by 17.9%, but with our QoS scheme, we are able to clamp it down. That performance degradation uh, reduces. And the same things we see on the NAS parallel benchmark here, uh, like the performance degradation was 32%, but we are trying to bring it up to, to, to 9%. So, so these are like the, some of the QoS schemes, and I think gradually one has to really bring these kind of things on large clusters so that you can really uh, run um, different jobs. We try to make sure that they, they are running with a, with a desired kind of uh, the execution time. Of course, this also has to be integrated with scheduler and all, so this is there a lot of work needs to be done here to have a complete solution which will work on the next generation systems. So finally, let me, um, I think we have around five to eight minutes. So, so let me focus on the fault tolerance aspect, fault tolerance and resilience. So as we discussed uh, yesterday, like all these large clusters, we are focusing on commodity system and especially when talking about exascal systems, there will be so many different components, the faults will always happen, okay? And this is an example I give it to my class. Think of like a laptop, very, very easily. If you think of a laptop, how many times it fails in a year? Zero? Either hardware or software failures. Yeah. Multiple times. Multiple times. So let's give a number. Five. five times, okay? So so if one laptop fails five times a year, if you have five laptops, or, or let's say you consider like 365 laptops, 365 laptops, or a server, 365 servers, so the failure will be five per day. All right? Add one more zero. 3,650 servers, okay? It will be five failures in 2.54 hours. So like this, if you keep on adding zeros to your number of servers, you will see that these failure rates, mean time between failures will come down so small, okay? So, so that means these faults will continuously going to happen on this system and how do we really handle it, okay? And that is a kind of a challenge. Of course, the petaflop systems have these issues. Teraflow systems had these issues, Exaflow will have, but the complexity is becoming more and more higher. And that's how we want to handle. So that actually proposes the need for reliability and fault tolerance. Of course, uh, people have been working on at the network level, the process level. So here I'll just focus at some of the MPI level. 
Uh, just to say like a checkpoint restart versus process migration, how do you detect low overhead failure prediction, and then I'll show some of these uh, benefits of this scalable uh, CR support, which we recently released. So this, we have been working on this. I mean, the MF is to stack as the checkpoint restart from many years back. We also introduced the process migration. Uh, so the difference is that checkpoint restart you do periodically, and then the migration you try to do in anticipation of failures. Okay, I'll come to that a little bit later. If you detect that like your, your uh, temperature is, is rising on your server, or the, you are seeing some more uh, memory errors, or um, uh, you are seeing some disk are being slowed down if you have disk, then that means this node is going to fail, or this rack may, may be going to fail. Uh, it is just like, uh, you know, I mean, we fall sick. Before falling sick, you get some symptoms. You started sneezing, you get some headaches. So those are like your symptoms that you might be falling sick, and then you try to hand over your task to your colleague or your students or to somebody else saying, look, for next two days, take, take these jobs from me. That's what we want to do in the process migration. And then here, like a performance perspective, like here it shows, like this is a checkpoint restart with a PBFS versus ext 3 but if you do a migration um, uh, with RDMA, you cut down the, the time significantly. And then we had a lot of different schemes here we compared. Uh, the base scheme is, of course, this pipeline migration, and that's what is available in the, in the MAPIS 2. Uh, so you can trigger that, that migration. And to detect this failure prediction, so we have designed a, uh, like a IPMI. IPMI is a software environment. Many of you might be knowing, you'll get a lot of sensor information uh, from, the, from the nodes. You can aggregate, like those are the symptoms. You will see whether the temperature is rising, the fans are going very high, and then we, integrated that with another project, which is a SIFT called Fault Tolerance Backplane, FTV I, IPMI. And then here we are showing like with, with uh, different kinds of, uh, with varying number of threads for this IPMI support, how quickly we, ca we can get that information. Uh, but this has not been integrated to the MFS2 stack yet. This is still another component. At some time we'll try to, try to integrate so that you can have both your fault prediction uh, kind of things coming and then uh, you can also do migration. Currently, the migration is triggered. With any other events, you can trigger them. Now, the next thing, uh, what I want to talk is this uh, scalable CR, and this is a project from Lawrence Livermore. They have been working for a long time. Yes? I am not really not an expert here. Uh, might be some of the people who are working I think I have read, like where there is a lot of projects going on in Sandia and at other places saying they should be able to fairly predict. Um, but again, it depends on the machines. Like if you understand, it's the same prediction model may not work across the machines, okay? Uh, in one installation, if you, if you do some of these analysis over a period of time, then you say these are your frequent failure, failure patterns based on some symptoms, and then you can, you can predict. Um, might be if anybody else wants to add here, uh, their experience, that will be good. Yeah. So, so the, here the idea is that, uh, of course, in a, a lot of compute nodes, so if you are trying to checkpoint uh, kind of things, uh, there are broadly systems level checkpointing, application level checkpointing, uh, and how do you store effective, so far everybody thinks that, okay, we should properly store to the, to the node, okay? But the Livermore has been working on this scalable checkpoint restart library, so they have various stages to have this resiliency like a low to high, okay? So there are different modes. So the first mode is just you copy to the local, local storage. Of course, if the local, if the local node dies, then, then you lose the data. But then they have a partner scheme. So here, not only you write to yours, you also write to your neighbor. So that's like called a partner. On top of that, again, they have an XOR scheme where the write file to local storage and small set of nodes collectively compute and the data is stored with uh, some redundancy. So that means if a node dies, you can re recreate the checkpoint completely. And then finally, you not only you write here, in the background you send the data to the, to the permanent file system so that those are the stable storage so you can recover. So the SCR actually allows all these models, so that's why we wanted to bring it in to the MAPIS2 stack so that people can actually experiment with all these things. And, and here it's just trying to show, like uh, SCR, you can do two kinds of things. One is an application level checkpointing. This is just trying to show a code flow. Uh, you just say, okay, SCR start checkpoint. Um, users select which checkpoints are transferred to global storage. Um, so you locally write here, like, let's say the, the second one is written, the previous checkpoint goes back to the stable storage, okay? And at any time, you are only keeping two of these. 
because the, the local ones, you are also through the partner and XR, you have enough redundancy, so you don't have to keep multiple of these checkpoints. So with two, maximum two, uh, you can handle. And here I'm just trying to show some numbers. These again, like a very fresh numbers, nobody has seen this. Uh, so we try to get this like a, some synthetic applications kind of behavior, like we are trying to write a 51 gigabytes of checkpoint and trying to show with a parallel file system, just the regular thing if you do how much time it takes versus the local, like we are, this is the new release we have, the latest release MFH 2.1.9b with SCR. Locally, if you write like this, if you do a partner, one partner, your performance goes down a little bit and with an XR, you effectively remain at the same time. So, so broadly, if you see, if you use this XR scheme or a partner scheme, you can significantly reduce the, the, the time um, from, uh, from using, going to the parallel file system. And this is here, we did a transparent multi-level checkpointing, so that means using the, all the levels, like you are first writing local and then trying to do this multi-level. And this is, we took an NGO. Many of you know the NGO is a very common cosmology application. And uh, so here we ran 512 MPI process, eight process per node. Uh, effectively, it has like a 12.8 gigabytes per checkpoints. So here, if you see the, the, how much time it takes to suspend the network, then reactivate the network, and the actual writing the checkpoint, this is where most of the time goes. And, and with the new scheme, you can see this red line from this big to this very tiny, we are able to reduce. And that's what actually is the, is the main thing, so that people should be able to utilize this combination to do application level checkpointing very quickly, uh, and then, then proceed with the computation. Okay, so in that way, you can get the best of the both worlds. You get high performance, and we also get the, like the uh, overall execution time. So, so this is what I strong, I'll strongly request you people, especially those who have the large clusters, try experimenting with this SCR with the MFH2 features, and you will see for your applications how much benefits you get. So with this, let me try to wind down. Um, between yesterday's talk and today's talk, we saw a lot of these things, and we are continuously working uh, our plans for the exact scale. Um, so performance and memory scalability remains still a big concern. And uh, some of you know, like the Mellanox is working on this DCT, which is a dynamically connected transport service. So once it comes, we'll be trying to work with that. Uh, the hybrid programming, we are continuously moving. I showed some of the numbers with the GPU Direct and Intel Mic symmetric processing. And uh, also, there's a collective offload framework I told yesterday a little bit about the non-blocking features. So that is also an, another emerging direction. We are working really how you can modify application and take advantage of that with the Core Direct. And then the RMA support, extended topology aware, power aware, tools interface and then this checkpoint restart. So, so with this, like between these two talks, I showed that InfiniBand with RDMA feature is gaining momentum in both HPC and it's trying to give you the best performance. But as the community moves to exact scale, continuously bigger and bigger challenges are coming. And this is what we need to resolve so that we can have some practical deployment. And I showed some of the solutions both from the MAPIS 2 and then the MAPIS X. Uh, and so that these designs will allow application scientists to really take advantage of these clusters. So these are all our sponsors, but, but these are the, all my heroes. For the last 10 to 12 years, all the students, postdoc, research scientists uh, who have done all the work, so I just want to give credit to them. Um, they do the hard work, I come and present, okay? Uh, but the, all the credits go to them. So with this, uh, I'll be finishing it here, and then in the afternoon, I'll give the, another talk on the big data side, okay? So with this, if there are any few quiz, quick questions, I can take care of now or we can discuss offline. Thank you.